Hi, do you everybody? My name is Patrick McKenzie, better known as Patty11 on the internet. Um, why do I come out all the way from Tokyo over to MicroConf every year? So I started my software business back in 2006 because I was following a life script that was laid out for me by somebody else that I did not pick and that I did not like. I was always skeptical when I was growing up that that could actually happen. You know, raging against the system always sounded to me as crazy, like, why don't you just not follow the system? Murder was the case that they gave me. I never really connected to that. But then I realized one day that salaryman was the case that they gave me. Um, salaryman is uh, a Japanese word for a full-time employee of a megacorp. Um, being a salaryman is a lot like murder. It just takes longer and is marginally more scalable. <laughs> and um, so I started this bootstrapping journey a, a few years ago. Some of you know the story. I'll be recapping a little bit of it over the course of the presentation. But it kind of took over my professional career. It worked out very well. And one of the reasons that it's worked out so well for me is uh, I've had the privilege of learning a lot from other people who made software companies who are in the bootstrapping community, uh, from Rob, from Heaton, from Jason, from uh, literally dozens of you folks. And I think that's why we all come out to MicroConf, because um, uh, we're sort of a community of purpose. Uh, uh, we share similar values. We have similar goals in mind. We have a diversity of skill sets, how we're going to actually achieve those goals. And uh, we love helping each other out. And that's one of the things I like most about this conference is that at a lot of conferences, there, there's the speakers and there's the unwashed masses. But um, there are no teachers at MicroConf. There are no students at MicroConf. There are only peers, people who are building their businesses, um, making wonderful lives for themselves and their families. And so um, you know, congrats on making it out here. And it always weirded me out a little bit that this community choose, chose Vegas for its point to come together, because Vegas is like the least micro country value kind of city I can think of. Um, because Vegas was basically like planned by Satan over the course of a week. And then after the week, somebody from Zynga called up Satan. Uh, Zynga has Satan on speed dial, speed dial 666. And they said, yo, bro, uh, while I appreciate that you're pretty good at this whole Prince of Darkness thing, you could have done it so much better. Your viral coefficient is below one. And do you even know what an engagement loop is? Get with the 21st century. Lead more people astray. MicroConf does not share those values. Most of us, uh, we are uh, very involved in our families, in our communities, both online and in our uh, actual physical world. Me, perhaps a little less in the physical world, although I did start singing in the choir lately, yay. Um, so a uh, quick shout out for, uh, for the uh, spouses and children who are in the audience. I know quite a few make it out every year. And for those of us who, those who are supporting us at home, Yay. Um, got a little bit of uh, um, honestly think that is probably the most important thing I will say, that if your business is um, enabling you to live the life with your family that you want to live, then that is great. And if it's not, no other success in the business will excuse that. Speaking of which, um, this is Lillian, my daughter. Uh, Rudika and I uh, welcomed her six months ago. Uh, She'll be speaking next year. It will probably be goo goo gaga. Um, so switching gears for a little moment, I want to talk about something from uh, developmental economics. It's called the flying geese curve. It was postulated by a Japanese economist in the 1930s, explaining um, he was pretty brilliant. He basically laid out what had happened in the last 20 years and what was going to happen over the course of the next 80 years for both the Japanese economy and the other developing economies in Asia. And it's called Flying geese curves, because if you draw this, um, and he was kind of vague on the axis, so I'm being kind of vague on the axis too, but if you draw this curve of uh, where a particular industry can take you, uh, you every, com every country, uh, country starts out basically having nothing, dirt poor. And how do you uh, become a you know, wealthy, developed nation if you're dirt poor? He says, you start somewhere where anybody could do it, which is the textile industry. A little fabric here. Because every country in the world has someone who's been making clothes because they're not walking around naked today. And the technology that you need to go from having a low-scale textile industry to a scalable textile industry was like proven to work by England in the 1700s. So all you have to do is do exactly what the English did, and you will eventually claw your way out of grinding poverty down here to having a textile industry, which is kind of working. First it will produce thread, then it will produce fabric, and then at some point you will be producing actual clothes. And you'll be able to take that advantage that you've created. Textiles only gets you so far. You take that advantage that you've created in textiles, 
infrastructure you've built up to make textiles, the educated population, the fact that the lights actually run every day. And you start on a better industry, something that has a higher ceiling to it that you would asymptotically approach. Typically that's something like steel or mineral, mineral production. And you do steel for a while. You get better at making steel. You get better at improving your, company's, uh, your country's infrastructure. You take the money that you made from steel and you invest it into industries which are harder to get into on the ground floor, like making automobiles. And your first automobiles are going to absolutely suck, but that's okay. You'll get better at making automobiles over time. Has anyone over here ever seen a picture of a Japanese car from the 1950s? They were undrivable death traps. <laughs> By 1970, uh, Toyota and Honda and company had come along and Japanese cars were actually kinda good and they sort of ran away with the world. And then you don't just stop there. You take what you've learned on making cars and you make high-end products. Robots, Japan is the number one producer of them in the world. Um, precision machining, uh, machining and engineering tools, automobiles, pharmaceuticals, yada yada. And over the course of a very short amount of time, this economist in the 1930s, before any of it had happened, said, if you follow the flying V curves, the flying geese curves, you go from being grinding in poverty to being on top of the world. And he also said one other interesting thing. He said that when you're on stage two over here, you'll have uh, friends in the neighborhood. In Japan's case, it was Asia, and they may or may not be friends. That's a long story and another talk entirely. Um, but you've got other countries in Asia who are nipping at your heels, and you're doing technology transfer with them, saying, hey, we're kind of done with this whole textile thing, and Japanese people are too expensive to make clothes anymore. But we'd be happy to have you make our clothes. We're going to be concentrating on the steel for now. And similarly, when they go up to cars, it's like, Japanese people are really too expensive to buy a steel from. We'll buy our steel from China. China's doing the steel thing these days, but China, Chinese people are too expensive to, buy, to make clothes. That's no problem. Look at that from Thailand. And then there's a bunch of dirt poor countries around Thailand who haven't started anything yet. But dot, dot, dot. And the entire um, economy of these interconnected companies, uh, countries gets better and better over time. I want to introduce my economic theory of development, which I call the flying geeks curve. You start out with absolutely nothing. So in 2006, nobody who knew who I was. I was barely capable of programming. Um, my first website was literally hand-coded in Notepad and then hosted on a $4 a month Go, uh, GoDaddy hosting. And it was targeting Bingo Card Creator, which has many, many things about it which should not make it a wonderful business. Oh, let me tell you an entire presentation on that fact alone. But um, I got pretty good at some stuff with Bingo Card Creators. It gradually approached an asymptote of how good you can possibly make a business selling bingo cards to elementary school teachers. Got good at SEO, got good at AdWords, and I started doing that for other companies on a consulting basis. And that made a little bit of money, got my name out there on the internet, was blogging during all this time, and I turned around and invested that into a SaaS company, Appointment Reminder, which does appointment reminding phone calls for professional services businesses. And that did, we'll talk a little bit more about it, how it did, I'm uh, giving my stats in this presentation for the first time. Uh, but recently, I stopped, uh, well, not stopped appointment reminder, it's not quite sold yet, uh, but I'm starting a new thing called Starfighter, um, which is only possible because I went through the whole grind here. And I'll tell you a little bit more about Starfighter in a minute. So I think if you talk to a lot of the founders here, um, this is something that's not obvious the, when it's your first rodeo, you'll find a lot of people here run portfolio businesses or they've run a succession of products. Almost nobody um, achieves the much vaunted hockey stick curve you know, within weeks of first starting a business. They grind up on a business which um, doesn't appear to have a very high asymptote as a business, doesn't appear to be very sophisticated. They get better at that, and then they layer businesses on top of that for the rest of their entrepreneurial career. And make no mistake, it's a career. I've been doing this for nine years now, which kind of blows my mind. Nine years from now, you may still be doing this, and you will be radically better at it than you are today. Um, but you can kind of like shorten it by like listening to the presenters up here who will tell you all the mistakes we made in building our businesses. Which I'm going to tell you several of the mistakes I made on picking which businesses and how I layered them together such that you can um, you know, achieve your goals in a more reasonable time frame than having to grind it out for nine years. So hands up here for people who are still pre-product. Awesome. Um, so. Well, I'll talk a little bit to you for a moment. I've been asking that question, I think, every year. And the first year at MicroConf, it was maybe 40 or 50% of the people didn't have a product yet. And then I see the same faces the next year, and most of them had actually shipped something. And then I saw the same faces the next year, their thing was doing well. And a few years later, did you guys know that one of the attendees to MicroConf the first year 
Like he didn't have a thing, and the second year he was selling some iPhone applications in the App Store, and it was doing kind of decently. And then like two years later, he sold the company to Marissa Mayer. Like that is a thing that actually happened. And there's lots of people who have uh, story, uh, stories like that in the audience. Definitely uh, ask them for their stories when you're meeting them later today. Anyhow, tutorial mission, your first business. Simple th the, the most important thing about your first business is that you actually start one. Um, I kind of like flopped around for 10 years with this idea that, oh yeah, eventually someday I want to try out that entrepreneurship thing, but I never like actually committed and ship something. And your life gets so radically better after you ship something. So ship something. Don't be paralyzed by the notion that it has to be the best possible business, that it has to be something that's uh, fundable by VCs, that it has to have a clear, achievable hockey stick within the next three weeks. That's not what you need. You just need something to get you out on the market, get you exposed to the mechanics of running a business, give you a platform to learn from, and to build up skills, which you will apply over the course of the rest of your career. It's almost certain that you will not eventually be known as the person who created the first thing that you made. Optimize for learning over perfection. Again, you know, I know some people, I don't think any of them are here, but folks have said, oh yeah, I've been doing uh, market research for the last two years. Market research for the last two years does not achieve the goals that you set out uh, when you wanted to become an entrepreneur. You would do much better to just say, okay, I've got a decent idea, halfway decent idea. Bingo card creator is even much less of a halfway decent idea, but it worked. Um, and if you just get that out after a little while and learn from it, you can have a much better idea on your second go round. Start accumulating unfair advantages for your business. So there are like seven billion people in the world and you don't want to be competing with all of them. On day one, when you don't know anything, when no one knows your name, when you haven't uh, been exposed to marketing and sales online, when this whole like, business thing is a uh, complete mystery to you, then you'll be like, exactly like I was on day one. But as you skill up, you're going to discover things that you're very good at, learn a little bit more, and you'll be able to do businesses that other people can't just, uh, can't just start on a whim. That will uh, be to your advantage. And then you probably want your first business to cover your minimum viable financial goal for uh, for Bingo Card Creator, back in the day, I was earning $3,000 at the day job. So if Bingo Card Creator could cover $3,000, which is not a whole lot of money, then I could quit the day job and go full-time on my thing and accelerate how quickly I could launch products and learn about them, which actually happened. How do you know something is an unfair advantage? One reason is, um, and I was talking about this earlier to someone, when you're in the thick of the business, it's not necessarily clear to you that you're really good at something but it's often clear to other people before it is to you. You should listen to feedback on that. If someone says, you are conspicuously good at this marketing thing, you are conspicuously good with customer support, listen to that and make choices based on it. I, I was uh, once chatting with Joel Spolsky, and uh, this was when Bingo Card Creator was my only thing, and he said, Patrick, you know a lot about uh, this SEO and AdWords. That seems pretty useful. Have you ever considered it use, using it for a business which isn't totally bullshit? And, <laughs> and so um, feedback from Joel Spolsky, who is a very smart guy, should tell me, oh yeah, that it, like, I thought it was easy, because I've just been doing it for the last two years, but it turns out that that isn't easy for most people. Maybe I should build a business around that. And I didn't, um, but more on that later. Watch other people around you in the community. You have many, many peers here who are super open about what's been working for them. Like, hear their numbers, hear what's been like a real slog in their business, hear what they're good at, and note the points where people are saying, yeah, it's been this real slog doing this thing, and you're like, really? I happen to be kind of good at that. I didn't even realize that was a problem, I just do it automatically and then get bogged down in you know, server administration. And the people who are really good at ser server administration should probably get in touch with the people who are really good at marketing and swap ideas like, hey, you're good at server administration, you're good at marketing, we should both do that for the other. And also use your growing understanding of your business to project out what your, this thing that you're good at in could possibly do for other businesses. So it turned out um, back in the day I was really good at A-B testing. And I understand the mechanics of A-B testing are, okay, if I'm running a $4,000 a month business and uh, I increase my conversion rates by 10%, then that's worth $400 a month to me. It's like, oh, that's cool. $400 is worth a, a little bit of money to me given that I had this idea in my mind that I was really worth $3,000 a month. But if you would like come out and ask me, Hey Patrick, how does A-B testing work if your company isn't making $4,000 a month? What if it's making $4 million a month? I would say, well, a 10% gain is a 10% gain, so that's where it's eh, plus or minus $5 million a year. 
I did not do that math for a while. And then one day I did that math and started charging like consulting rates based on it. And uh, that worked out pretty well. And my peak consulting rate in my career was about $30,000 a week uh, for the same, like my pitch to clients was basically, I can make your marketing as effective as bingo card creators. Um, <laughs> seriously. Um, so I'm going to say something which is going to be a little controversial. And honestly, I hate that I'm going to say it. Uh, because I am a SaaS guy. I, like, if you opened my veins, they would bleed software as a service applications. Uh, but if it's your first rodeo, I suggest not doing SaaS. And here's why. There are huge barriers to successfully shipping SaaS in the first place and then keeping it up and running. What does that mean? It often takes you know, several months to often, you know, say, six months to get like the minimum viable version 1.0 of a SaaS into the marketplace. And it is a long slog, particularly if you've uh, never been solo shipping a software product before. And then keeping it running, there's a spectrum of, uh, say, criticality for SaaS businesses, where bingo card creator went into SaaS is not too critical. If it goes down for three hours, that's unfortunate, but it, it won't um, cause anybody's uh, lives to be permanently altered. And there's appointment reminder. Appointment reminder has, um, it can go down for up to three seconds. If it goes down for more than three seconds, life starts to get very, very bad. And that's invariant with regards to how much money your SaaS is making. And um, spoiler alert, all SaaSes make no money at the beginning. So if you are getting a phone call at 3 a.m. in the morning telling you you need to you know, log into your server right now and do uh, incident server maintenance, or you need to deal with a heart bleed catastrophe, or blah, 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 phone call at 3 a.m. in the morning, when you're making like $200 from your SaaS, A, that's not econo economically rational, and B, it's going to feel morale-wise like just a punch to the teeth. Um, spoiler alert, SaaS doesn't make any money in the, in the beginning. There's this great, great presentation online called the long, slow SaaS ramp of death, which um, describes the revenue curve for most SaaS companies that don't immediately hit a hockey stick. I'm going to show you uh, the first 18 months of appointment reminders revenue curve right now. And uh, just for the folks in the back who can't read it, it started out making $20 a month, and 18 months later it had achieved the commanding heights of $1,200 a month. And yeah, yeah, thanks guys. And I was starting this from a position of advantage. I had already run a business for four years at this point. People like Joel Spolsky were coming out of the woodwork and asking me for marketing advice. I was supposed to be good at this. Apparently, not so much. Um, and I remember there was, do you see this little jump here? It's a, it looks like a big jump on the graph, but it's a jump of like $200. I killed myself this month with two weeks of full-time work on my own thing and two weeks of work for a consulting client. I then, at the end of the month, celebrated a $60,000 check from the consulting client and MRR plus equals 200. And I was like, oh, what am I doing with my life? So if you want to make a SaaS, if that's in your near-term career goals, and SaaS is a wonderful model, recurring revenue is the best kind of revenue, I highly endorse it. Here's the glide path. Start by planting a flag in a market that you want to serve with something which is um, tightly contained and consumable. So an ebook, a WordPress plugin, um, even the first version of Bingo Card Creator back when it was totally downloadable software. Something where if the website goes offline in the middle of the day, the only thing you lose is, oh, a few sales, rather than, oh, um, literally happened for appointment reminder at one time. I had to restore service to the server by 7.30 a.m. New York time before little kids failed to get the uh, the phone call reminding them to take their anti-cancer medication. Um, that was a lot of stress. AR was making $2,000 a month at that point, and that was way, way, way too much stress for $2,000 a month. Start collecting email addresses. Um, you know, you're going to hear a lot about email marketing at, uh, during the course of MicroConf. It comes up every year. You're also going to hear a lot more about pricing and charge more. The reason we keep repeating the same piece of advice every single year is not because we love hearing the echoes of our pre previous presentations. It's because they're cheat codes for life. So get email addresses. Um, you know, uh, for like a pre-launch list for a book, for giving out a free chapter, whatever. Uh, after you've established uh, some amount of reputation in that, uh, in that industry, you can use that and then piggyback better businesses on top of your existing platform. You're, oops. You're going to want to start a productized consulting business. I'll talk about that a little in a moment. And then gradually, you're going to transform your productized consulting business less from you doing the work to more your software doing the work. 
So here's the naive implementation of like best practices SaaS for the bootstrapped entrepreneur. You have a three-tier uh, plan grid. Plan number one is $29 to $49. Um, BTW, I would suggest going with $49, but I know that's a hard sell for people who are just starting out. You think, oh man, I'm not worth $49. I'm only worth $29. I literally had that issue about charging like $25 once per lifetime in the beginning. You are worth the $49 if you're solving any problem which is valuable to a business. Anyhow, tier number two, $99. It's like tier number one, except it costs more money and there's a entry in our database which allows you more quota of whatever it is your application does. And tier number three, $249, you'll get a few of them early on and then you'll discover they have all sorts of weird mini enterprise requirements and you'll build those over the course of the next couple of months. This is a naive way to do things. If I was launching a SaaS application today, here's my pricing model. I'm going, um, and this is literally my idea for uh, what my NASA, next SaaS application was going to be. I was going to give this year to appointment reminder, grind on it really hard, sell it, and then start a SaaS application to do SaaS pricing pages because I'm really, really good at SaaS pricing, really, really good at like marketing. I have a pre-existing audience in the software community. Tier one was gonna be $99 a month where I give you some sort of interface that you can log into and make SaaS pages. That wasn't actually going to exist on day one. That's the product I'm going to build. Tier number two, $500 a month. I don't just give you the capability of making the SaaS page, I will tell you what, uh, SaaS pricing page, I will tell you what needs to be on it and how we are going to improve that. I'll give you three A-B tests that we're gonna run every month. I'm going to sign up for a cheap plan at Optimizely or Visual Website Optimizer and physically run those tests for you. At the end of every month, I'll send you a nice PDF report so you can take it to your CEO and say, it was really good that we paid Patrick $300 this month. He increased our MRR by 10,000 bucks. And then tier three, uh, for between $2,500 and $10,000 a month, whatever I thought I could get, I would tell a company, I will be your outsourced chief revenue officer. You have some questions about what should be in your plans, you have questions about what your pricing strategy would be, blah, 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 I will take care of all that stuff for you, you will go back to building this business. And I would have sold three or four of these before day one. Um, and this is, that would be, and difficult for where I was coming from in 2006, given that I had nothing, but um, from where I am right now, I could go to previous consulting clients and say, hey, you know, I'm good for it. Um, give me your, you know, like, okay on a handshake, will you pay me 10K a month to do this? If I can get three of them to do that, then I've got 30K a month of recurring revenue, or, you know, four times 2.5K is 10K a month of recurring revenue on day one, not year five. And then I can use that to, you know, pay people to help me um, to help me build the SaaS application that would eventually replace tier one, um, to develop my marketing message, to uh, spend some time figuring out what sort of sales message, work, message works and grow the business from there. So that's my advice if you're thinking of starting a SaaS business in the near future. Let me tell you about the most important bit of advice that I have ever ignored and that I suggest you not ignore. So I had this idea for appointment reminder. It was going to be awesome. It was going to use the Twilio API. It was going to make no-show rates go down at dentist offices. And I told this idea to Peldi, who's the guy behind Balsamic Software uh, at the Business of Software Conference one year. I'm like, yeah, it's going to be great, awesome. They'll make a lot of money. And he says, Patrick, 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 we've been friends for a few, a few good years, right? Can I, can I level with you? Do you really get up in the morning thinking, I will love if I spend today on optimizing the schedules of dentist offices? I said, oh God, no, of course not. Who would want that? But it's a great business. It'll, it will clearly work well. It's like, stop, don't do it. You're gonna spend the next five years of your life on this thing. If you don't bounce up with excitement for it every morning, you're not gonna do the work that it takes to push it forward, and you're gonna be miserable with yourself. I'm like, ah, Peldi, you're funny. And I ignored him. <laughs> Worst mistake of the last 10 years. So um, I would, encourage you not to ignore Peldi. Do something that you will love. Um, one of the biggest unfair advantages you can have is a confluence of like product market founder fit, where you're building something for a market that you actually care about, your product solves a pain you actually care about, and you're the right person to be building that product. Like, um, and I'll talk a little bit about how that product market founder fit is something that I think we're going to have for Starfighter, my new thing, and why that's going to make it a joy to work with rather than something that I'm slogging through every day. So. As you are layering on businesses with this, uh, you know, leveling up, tearing up towards uh, greater heights scale, you should probably continue serving the save market because it will make your life much, much easier. Some people in this audience are very good about doing that. Brennan Dunn, for example, uh, planted his flag in freelancers and consultants uh, five years ago or so now. 
and he's got five or six or eight products. He's, he's got a large portfolio, but they're all for freelancers or consultants. You can reuse the same list, you can reuse the same reputation, you can re reuse the same learnings he has about what challenges they have. I was not that smart. I made bingo card creator for elementary school teachers, and then I made appointment reminder for the um, you know, office managers at like dental practices and accounting firms. And that made life very, very difficult for me because I had, you know, I literally had 300,000 teachers who had used Bingo Card Creator before. Number of them who ever used Appointment Reminder, a big fat zero. Um, I had a reputation at this point uh, from, you know, blogging for several years. Number of people in my target market who cared about it for Appointment Reminder, big fat zero. Uh, it was not a great overlap. Now, should I have just gone uh, to overlap with the teaching market again? That probably would not have been the right choice for me because I was very sure by the time I got done with Bingo Card Creator, this is the last time I'm ever doing a B2C software or software which sells to teachers. But I should have had a heart-to-heart -heart with myself with Point Reminder and think, not just for this business, but for the business that comes after this one. Where do I want to be working? What makes sense for me? And what would have made sense, is even at you know, early in 2010, it was pretty clear that I was good on this intersection of marketing and engineering. I had a lot of buddies in the software industry. They trusted me and liked me. I should have done something you know, software for software companies, in some sense, if I was going to launch a SaaS application. So when I actually did that later, when I started consulting and then doing productized consulting and now doing Starfighter, all for software companies, it's a cheat code for life. It is unreal how much easier it is to get clients when I already have a list of 12,000 people who love getting email from me about how to make their software company better. It's unreal how easy it is to close sales when I can go to 20 people who have bought consulting services from me before and the conversation literally, has literally gone in some cases like this. Hey, I just wanted to touch base with you. I'm founding something which will be interesting to software companies in two months. And some people were like, I'm in, what is it? <laughs> and um, no lie, like uh, literally ha hand shook on six figures of revenue for some contracts after on the strength of like one hour of telling them what it is. And it's like, yeah, you're clearly good for it. We've done business before, I wanna do that. Whereas nobody in, you know, there was no hospital system in 2010 saying, oh, you have something that hospitals will find, uh, will find uh, interesting? Well, let me make it mad, rain mad money on you. Um, did not happen. So as you are leveling up in these businesses, um, each business that you, that you make should be kind of quite, quite a step up for you versus the last business. You want to uh, be attacking a more salient problem, both in terms of something which is difficult to attack and something which honestly achieves a little bit of an impact in the world. Uh, bingo card creator, um, I did like for the fact, like working for the last nine years to help, you know, help teachers, help kids learn how to read, that's nice. But if bingo card creator just like vanished, the world would not be terribly worse off. You know, it's, it's definitely a, uh, what's the word, vitamin rather than a painkiller. Uh, but later businesses were substantially broader in scope. Um, they were harder to execute on. And that was both good for the business, good for my clients, and good for myself. Use what you've learned about engineering for your old businesses to build your new businesses. Use what you've learned about sales and marketing techniques. You know, if you've learned how to be the, uh, really good at running an AdWords campaign for a, uh, for a small business, try to apply that in your new business. Try to build on top of it. Also try to find the places where, okay, um, uh, it doesn't obviously apply to this business. Most of the other people running this business don't, you know, they don't do AdWords or they don't do SEO because that's just not something that's done in this industry. But I have pre-existing skill in that. I know something that they don't about it. Maybe I can find the angle that allows me to use that skill profitably on this new, better business. And you can just improve on like the sophistication of the business operation. Um, for example, I started, uh, I was one guy alone in this kitchen. And that was that, uh, me for quite a few years. And then after that, I hired a uh, succession of freelancers for just you know, one, one week to two weeks at a time doing piecemeal work. I had a long-term virtual assistant working for a while and then a employee. And now I've got co-founders. Um, so you know, that scaling up in sophistication over time over the course of your career works out pretty well, if you want to. Nothing says that you can't be a uh, solo founder for forever if that's right for you. I'll tell you why. Um, when I was given an opportunity uh, late last year, I decided to stop being a solo founder in a few minutes. So Rob asked me to talk about what was going through my head during like, the, the rough middle years of my career when I would already had Bingo Card Creator and Bingo Card Creator was working decently, but Appointment Reminder was doing the long, slow SaaS ramp of death up. It was honestly really rough. 
I am, you know, lots of people in the industry think I'm a fairly smart guy. I was hearing that uh, on a fairly regular basis. I was uh, putting up blockbuster results for clients, and in my own business, it was just kind of puttering along, both because um, I did not love the business, so I did not want to work on the business. If I woke up on any given Tuesday and Tuesday was like, okay, I'm free to do appointment reminder work today, what would actually happen was a lot of League of Legends game, games. Um, and it took a long time, and there were a lot of points in here where I'm just like, I should just quit this and do something I actually like. And uh, this might not be reproducible in terms of um, achieving motivation to not quit, but I've been blogging about my business for forever since day one. And I realized that if I was going to quit this business two years into it without having achieved anything of what I set out to quit, I would have to write a blog post saying I quit appointment reminder and it sucked. Um, and that, you know, the fear of writing that blog post was a lot bigger than the fear of going bankrupt. Or um, uh, ask me about this later if you want to hear the gory details. But at this point, I had about $100,000 on credit card bills uh, that were, uh, you know, sunk into the business. I was not really feeling that at the $3,000 a month the business was returning, um, but eventually managed to pull it out. Um, how I pulled it out, well, one thing, running a portfolio business, Bingo Car Creator was able to fund a lot of the development. Um, I actually got asked in Silicon Valley, so, oh, you're running this appointment reminder thing, that's kind of interesting. How long have you been doing it? Three years, oh great. Who did your seed round? Bingo Car Creator, got great terms. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, so, uh, it was funding the development in a large degree. And then late in the game, uh, Appointment Reminder started working both because I sunk my teeth into it and because I discovered how to do medium touch sales. I would talk to you a lot about that, but Steli has an entire presentation going um, where he's going to talk about it, so just listen to Steli. So I recently ended a big chapter in my life. For the last nine years, I've been the bingo card creator guy. And I sold bingo card creator to someone. Uh, her name is Beth, she's a teacher. I sold Bingo Card Creator to Beth on April 2nd. Um, so, uh, oh. <laughs> thanks very much. So I wanna talk about a little about what the process of selling it was like, when I knew I should sell it, and what selling it uh, did for the business, and also how you, you know, if a sale is in your future, maybe in the next six months, maybe in the next six years, how you can start laying the groundwork for that to uh, make it as stress-free of a, uh, process for yourself as possible. So when do you know that it's time to move on from a business? Um, if your business is not helping you achieve the, the larger goals you have in life, that isn't the number one signal. I think I had a, a quip at one of the microcomps one year that I had three big goals with my business, to live, to learn, and to love. Living being, you know, having a work-life balance where I would be able to feel the grass under my feet, uh, have free time with my wife, do international travel, Bingo Card Creator helped me achieve that back when I started it, but it was no longer necessary for it in the last couple of years. Love, obviously, I love my wife, I love my daughter, I want to love my customers too. And I think back in 2006, I genuinely loved teachers. I loved helping them out with their problems. And then came um, six years of being the sole customer support agent for Bingo Card Creator. And I think if you had asked me in 2012, hey Patrick, do you love teachers? I would have said, I love teachers. We aim to give best in the world customer support to our beloved teaching clients. <laughs> but it would have been a lie. Um, I had uh, been accused many too many times of breaking the Googles uh, by teachers. Like, I downloaded your software and now Google does not work. Give me back my Googles or I will tell my husband on you. Uh, actually happened. That remains my best customer support inquiry in uh, many years. I actually met the guy at Google who broke the Googles that day. Like, I will buy you a beer to hear the story, and you owe me a beer to compensate for emotional suffering. Um, anyhow, if you've, oh, and learning. I had learned everything there was to learn about bingo card, like selling bingo cards over the internet on AdWords, on uh, uh, search engine optimization by, say, like 2010, 2011. And after that, it was just going through the motions of grinding it out every day. I should have been you know, engaged in new businesses that would allow me to continue learning, sinking my teeth into new challenges. That's what honestly really motivates me. If you have stopped accumulating marginal advantages from running a business, it might be time to move on. You know, if you are thinking about this in a planned out manner, you th think, okay, my career is going to extend from right now for the rest of my life until I decide to retire. And am I continuing to make forward progress in terms of the skill set, the platform, the reputation, the material advantages that I have to fill out the rest of the career? 
if a particular business has like hit that asymptote where bingo card creator was about as good as selling bingo cards on the internet could get. Could I have ground it out for another like plus 10% if I had worked a lot harder on it? Sure, but I wasn't gonna learn anything doing that. It would just be grinding it out every day. If you've, if you've learned everything you're going to learn, if you've accumulated everything, you know, you've got all the merit badges from that business, start something new, get new merit badges. And then it's, you'll know it when it happens to you. You sometimes get signals from the business or from life itself that it's just, it's clearly time for you to be done. I can tell you exactly when that happened for Bingo Card Creator. I have this friend named Jason in Tokyo. Jason is also a software entrepreneur, so we get together, we talk shop. And so I told Jason one day, hey Jason, you'll never guess what email I just got. He's like, actually, I will. You just got an email from an elementary school teacher. She asked you a stupid question, like the last eight times that you've started a, started a question with, hey Jason, you'll never guess what kind of email I got. And guess what? I don't run Bingo Card Creator. I run a decent business. You know why I don't run Bingo Card Creator? Because I don't like hearing stupid questions from elementary school teachers about bingo cards. Take it somewhere else. And like, I want more of what you're having. <laughs> so I went out to get it. So if you need to prune a portfolio product, uh, uh, project from yourself, you've got three basic options. Number one is shut it down. I think this one gets given short shrift in the community. Um, there's always people who complain when you know, a business starts out, they get a few customers, and then the business doesn't work out, and 18 months later they say, okay, it's closing down in a few months, and they get lambasted on Hacker News and Twitter and whatnot. Very important for you to understand this. You do not owe the world your labor on any particular project. If some customer is paying you $10 a month to you know, build them a SaaS application, let's say hypothetically they were paying you $10,000 a month to be an engineer at their office. What do you owe them in terms of ongoing availability? In the United States, you can walk into their office any day and say, this job, I don't really like it anymore. I don't need to give you any reason other than I don't like it anymore. Two weeks from now, I'm out of here. That's what you get, that's the guarantee of service you get if you're paying someone $10,000 a month. If you're giving someone $10 a month, your guarantee of service is basically nothing. If your thing is something where you can just conveniently turn it down, if you've got like an ebook business, and for whatever reason the ebook business is not getting you to where you wanna be in life, just take down the webpage. See if anybody complains, I bet they won't. If it's a SaaS application, feel totally free to say, all right, um, 90 days from now, the servers are going dark. We're going to assist you in, uh, in getting to a, uh, another provider. We're sorry, it just didn't work out. And that's all the explanation you owe anybody. And people will, will rant and rave about that on the internet, but it's true. You owe your, your first responsibility to so many people more than your, the customers of your SaaS company, to your family, to your friends, to your community, uh, et cetera. Don't run a business that makes you miserable. Putting it into maintenance mode is another option. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about maintenance mode in a minute, and selling it is another option. We'll talk about that. Here's what maintenance mode looks like. I don't know if you can read this, but this is my GitHub graph of when I was actually doing work on appointment reminder, uh, sorry, on Bingo Card Creator. So, div, like, as a product, Bingo Card Creator was done in early 2011. It achieved everything Bingo Cards sold over the internet ever wanted to achieve. Soon after that, I had a customer support rep answering most of the email, and so it just went into maintenance mode. I made sure my customer support rep knew that I was there if she had any questions that she couldn't answer. I made sure she got paid every month. And I made sure the server stayed running. But other than that, I did very little development over the course of the next few years. And that makes sense. If a business is both capable of running in maintenance mode indefinitely, and if your business is stable, both from a technical perspective, from a market perspective, the market isn't like crashing out from under you, um, and if you've got good people running it for you. Um, I was working with a VA named uh, Sugar, and uh, Sugar has been a godsend to me for the last four years. She's been very reliable, never had to replace her, retrain her replacement. If I was doing that every six months, I would have shut down Bingo Card Creator a long time ago. Um, Sugar actually worked out so well that after, um, after I sold Bingo Card Creator, I figured out a way to retroactively uh, uh, get her cut in for a portion of the business. Um, so that's actually one of the things I love about being a bootstrapper. If you attempt to do that as a funded entrepreneur, um, the VCs and your board members will be like, wait, no, you can't retroactively cut in a customer support rep for a substantial fraction of the purchase price of the business. That is just not the way cap tables work. Like, ooh, let me run this by my board. It's me, 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 oh, my wife, and Lillian. 
Uh, we're all in favor of uh, cutting sugar in here. Um, yeah, anyhow. So, how do you know if uh, the business that you're running is potentially saleable? There's sort of a Goldilocks zone, not too little, not too much, in terms of what revenue you're doing. If your business is only doing $500 a month of revenue, it's probably not worth someone's effort to both close the purchase of a business, which by the way, whether a business is worth $10,000, $100,000, or $100 million, selling it is a painful time suck. So no one wants to go through a painful time suck to buy a business which is only worth $500 a month and then figure out how to run that and how to slap that into their existing operation. Similarly, if your business is doing $10 million a month for you know, some verified kind of thing like doing, I don't know, optimiz optimization of pricing for various products sold by the banking industry. There might only be two or three firms in the world which both have the financial wherewithal and operational expertise to run your business. That'll make selling it a lot harder. But if your business is doing, say, $10,000 or, well, a couple of tens of thousands of dollars a year in, uh, in revenue or a couple of hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, that's sort of the sweet spot for selling businesses these days. Your business needs to have low time, ongoing time commitment from the founder. And you might not realize how much time you're spending on your business. God knows I didn't. But the people who buy it will. Because anything that you were doing as of the last day you worked on the business that they start doing on the first day they're working in the business and they don't do will suddenly cause things to break. And since people are sophisticated, they don't want things, you know, they don't want to write you a check for several hundred thousand dollars and have things start breaking the next day. So they'll want a rigorous accounting of what you do for the business exactly, how often you do it, how long it takes you, and what skills you need to do that, and why haven't you already outsourced this to someone. So you can prepare the groundwork for that by outsourcing it. People do not want to write a check to your business or to you for several hundred thousand dollars and then have the business vanish two days later because of a Google algorithm update. So saleable businesses have defensible revenue with low risk that they're going to just vanish. People want to buy a business that's in a growing market, something where there's clear ongoing need for this and there will be ongoing need for this five years from now, 10 years from now, rather than some fetish kind of thing. And um, this surprised me, but a lot of the people who buy software businesses are not software people. So they might not uh, have your level of technical skill. You built it from the ground up. They did not. They certainly don't have your familiarity with the code base. They do not want their expensive purchase to explode in a fireball on day one. So you need to mitigate the technical risk. There's ways to do that. Let's talk about it. Some early decisions you can make prior to building the business even, or while you're building up the business that will make it easier to sell later. In terms of what market and what prob problem you're attacking, pick something where that problem will always be a problem. If you're solving hiring, hiring will always be a problem. If you're making additional money, uh, you know, increasing the revenue of clients in the dental industry, that will always be a problem. There will never be a day where dentists suddenly say, it's like, no, no, we're good. We don't need any more money. Uh, we don't want to buy anything to make us more money. Don't, don't go after things which they're faddish in nature or um, they have a short shelf life to them. One example of this is video games. Video games typically have a curve where they sell the most they're ever gonna sell in the first like one to two weeks after the video game is released, and then they fall off a cliff. It's very difficult to sell a video games business unless it's like a business business and it has a repeatable process for creating new video games. Technology stack. You wanna pick something which is simple and well understood. There's many, many sources of risk to your business and you don't wanna be a, you don't wanna put your like risk bet on the technology. If you're running a website, run the website on WordPress. There's lots of people who understand WordPress. There's lots of great ways to host WordPress. If you want somebody to, um, to edit a WordPress site for you, there's hundreds of thousands of developers who can handle that for you. Do it like that. Technology platform for a, SA for a SaaS business. Build on top of Ruby on Rails or something which is pretty well established in 2015. Something you understand well and that will be here for a while. Don't build on top of like, hey, there's this JavaScript framework that came out three months ago which is made by uh, you know, a Stanford-like Stanford undergrad, and it is the new hotness right now. Like All the cool kids are using it, because all the cool kids will be using something completely different six months from now, and you'll have to support that piece of junk for the rest of your life. And when you tell a client, yeah, you've got to support this piece of junk, which, by the way, I'm the only person in the world who understands, um, and I'm not available to answer questions about it, they'll be like, mm, no, I think I'm going to buy an app that's written on Ruby on Rails or something that's sane where I can actually find a developer to handle this for me. Traffic sources. You want two things, diversity and defensibility of traffic. So 
if your business gets 97% of its revenue from people coming from organic Google traffic, and, when you and they ask you, wow, you're really good at SEO, what do you do? And your answer starts with, I've got this trick, see? Um, they're going to think, many people have said that about Google over the years. And many of those people find that works out very well for them for two years, three years, five years. And then one day, Matt Cutts wakes up on the wrong side of bed, and that business vanishes in a fireball. And you don't want to say, you should pay $500,000 for a business which could at any time vanish in a fireball. So you want to be able to say, I get, um, you know, I get 40% of our traffic from uh, Google SEO. We've been doing that very well. It's within the guidelines. I get another 40% from, Ad, from AdWords. We've been optimizing our AdWords campaign for the last couple of years. The remaining is a grab bag of this and this and this. It's defensible. If any one of these like, titrates down a little bit, not the biggest problem in the world. And uh, it's very difficult for a competitor to replicate starting from nothing because they've got to get good at SEO, they've got to get good at AdWords, and they've got to uh, you know, accumulate the links that we've got from these other places. And then um, you want to have the founder involvement be variable with the desires of the new owner of the business. So if they want to run it in a hands-off fashion, if they've already got eight things in their portfolio and your thing is going to be the ninth, and they just want to buy your business to slot it into the portfolio, you want to be able to say, this business is well understood. We have good processes in place. We have people to run the processes. As of day one, you don't have to do anything. But some of the people will be buying your business to kind of um, you know, give it a bit of a tune-up. And you want to be able to say, there are levers that you can move in this business that will allow you to make it better. So for example, when I was selling a bingo card creator, you're not going to be better at uh, doing uh, SEO for bingo cards than I am. That is a very high bar. No, no buyer should reasonably expect the ability to do that. On the other hand, I have done no email marketing for Bingo Card Creator for the last five years, and any email marketing beats no email marketing. So as of day one, if you want to actually grow this business, I would suggest starting doing some emails. Or start, uh, you know, move from, um, I know that the charging model for this business is suboptimal. It's one time, it should be recurring. As of day one, you can start like transitioning from a one-time revenue model to a recurring revenue model. That's a place both for you to put your stamp on the business and feel good about that and start growing the value of it. What you'll need in place before you do a sale. You want to understand all your numbers drop dead cold. And uh, this means your revenue numbers, your expense numbers. You want, if possible, having uh, statements from bookkeepers slash accountants who have audited this stuff for you. And you need to make sure that they uh, actually add up because people will check. Uh, my buyer actually got a due diligence report run in my business, and someone who literally used to work for Goldman Sachs got a copy of my database and a copy of every log that I've ever gotten from um, PayPal and Stripe, and they manually compared them, seriously. And the due diligence report came out and said, um, there was one misrepresentation about the state of the business. A transaction on July 7th, 2014 was charged back on, uh, in August of 2014, and this was not recorded in the books resulting in overstatement of revenue of $29.95. We do not believe the statement of revenue to be material. Like, holy cow. Um, that is the level of professionalism that you want. You want to isolate the assets to be sold from the rest of your business. I had a MailChimp account, which was shared between four, four things that I ran, because I really wanted to save myself that $10 on MailChimp. And so while I was going through one of the most stressful processes of my life of selling this thing, I was having to re-architect three other apps to use different MailChimp accounts, or um, you know, migrate from Drip because I don't want to use MailChimp anymore for them. And uh, uh, that was you know, problems I didn't need. My bingo card creator was on this, uh, the same uh, Rackspace hosting account that the rest of my businesses were, because I thought, well, having two credit card uh, you know, lines on my statement from Rackspace every month is wasteful. I'll save Rackspace the trouble of having that second credit card line in my statement. And then I had to like, move those VPSs. And I asked Rackspace, what do, you, what do you do for moving a VPS between accounts? And Rackspace's fanatical support answer to this was, we fanatically support you not doing that. Um, <laughs> and um, what? We're like, well, our best option is um, you, you know, use some command in Linux to take a copy of the hard drive, and then you like, SCP that over to a new machine, and then rehydrate it, and hopefully everything works. Like, <laughs> that sounds like a really bad idea. Um, that's what I ha had to do. I had to make a, a new account and a new hosting provider and copy everything over. And I lost like a week of my life dealing with you know, the random technical, technical debt that that implies. So if you are doing something, you know, if you're starting your second business in the next couple of weeks and you're thinking, 
should I put it on the same VPS to save myself $5 a month? Don't do that. You're buying yourself a lot of pain later. Minimize the founder ongoing time commitments. If you haven't already outsourced anything, outsource it as much as possible. And block off a few months. I'm going to show you what the timeline uh, for Bingo Card Creator sale looked like. But Bingo Card Creator, it's, a, it's like the platonic minimal of how complicated a business could be. And this process took me uh, four solid months to complete the sale. Should you use a broker? Yes. Next slide. <laughs> I'll tell you why. Um, when you're running a portfolio of businesses, there's lots of stuff that you, uh, that you have to do, and it's honestly very, very stressful. Um, and you're going to be trying to run the sale at the same time. What your broker is going to do is they're going to find qualified buyers, pre-vet them for you to make sure that they're not bozos and they actually have the capability to write a check for a substantial amount of money. And um, they're going to deal with stuff that comes up in the process. So after working very, very hard for four months, and by the way, starting a new company at the same time and having a five-month-old uh, home at the same time, I had not slept um, between the hours of midnight and 6 a.m. in literally two weeks prior to closing day. I got to closing day, I'm like, it's great. They're going to sign the, sign the asset purchase agreement that makes the uh, close of Bingo Card Creator uh, final. And apparently the person was on the phone with the broker about, um, you know, the broker thought, okay, you sign on page 32, and they're like, I've got one question, and it's about the price. Can I get like a 40% discount to it? Um, and this is after, you know, weeks of negotiation. And thankfully the broker was like, A, no, this deal will not happen now, and we will never do business with you again in any capacity. And B, they immediately started working on, uh, they had had a you know, backup buyer in the wings for me, which I didn't even know that one needed a backup buyer, which you do in case your buyer decides to pull out at closing. Um, and so they really, really earned their commission for me. Um, by the way, the broker I used is FEI. I think uh, Thomas uh, Smales is here from, uh, he's the founder of the company, he's over there, a lovely British gentleman. Um, give him your business. They're the best guys in the industry. This is what the timeline looked like. Um, so January and February, I was laying the technical and organizational groundwork, you know, like breaking up my Rackspace account, getting things moved over, yada, yada, writing lots of pro process documentation. March, I started working with Thomas. They started working up the prospectus. They gave me 200 questions that I had to answer. Um, late March, they found the buyer, uh, and then it fell apart once, and then they found another buyer. Uh, April 2nd, the buyer uh, wrote the contract. April 8th, the wire transfer hits my bank account, and May 3rd, which is one month after April 2nd, uh, my um, handover period expires, which means I'm helping her for the first month to get the ropes of the business. And after the handover period expires, I expect to never say the word bingo again in my life. <laughs> what the process looks like. Um, and huh, I'm running, what do you think, Rob, on sort of the timing of things? Five minutes left? OK. Um, so I won't be able to tell you too much about Starfighter. Sorry, but get me, uh, talk to me later, and we'll uh, talk about that. I'll just get through the part about uh, selling the business. Here's what the process looks like. You gather data on everything, all of your, you know, everything from how many subscribers you have in MailChimp to your uh, transaction records, starting from the mists of prehistory to your bank account details, your uh, books, uh, your AdWords stats, your Google Analytics stats. Um, you also get 100 free-form questions about, tell me about what technology stack this is made on. Who made it? Are they still available? Are, do you know of any weaknesses in the technology? Have you ever had legal issues? If so, describe them. Blah, 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 times 100. The broker works that into a prospectus, um, which is basically just a document that says, for sale, one bingo card creation business slightly used, and then lists out, um, it, I think our prospectus was literally like 30 pages of information about bingo card creator. Um, which kind of surprises me, and yet I've written a million words about it over the years, so maybe not so much. They find and vet a buyer, and during this process, they tell the buyers, do not talk to the owner. We will be very pissed at you if you ever talk to the owner except instead of talking through us, which is great because it firewalls you from having to deal with you know, 50 buyers that they might be working with in parallel. They vet the buyer, make sure that they can actually pay the amount of money that they uh, expect to be able to pay and that they have a sufficient uh, sufficient level of sophistication to run the business that they, you want them to run. You sign an LOI which says basically, um, I strongly intend to buy this business one week from now for this price. I'm going to enter due diligence now. Pending completion of due diligence, it's on. Um, which isn't contractually binding, but it establishes expectations. And only then do you start due diligence. Due diligence sucks because you literally like, have to talk with people who, who should be working at Goldman Sachs about $24.95 accountant discrepancies. Um, and they want to see 
everything. Uh, like I got questions about, you know, your AdWords account says that you spent this much money in these months, but you have a page on the Bingo Card Creator website which you didn't even disclose to us, which shows your AdWords totals per month, and it has a different number of conversions per month. Explain the difference. Like, oh, well, uh, this one is, you know, Google scores a conversion in the month that it happens, but I scored it in the month that the uh, click happened because that was more useful for my internal decision-making processes. They're like, great, give us an Excel model that, uh, that show, shows that those two numbers are close to each other. And so I literally had to whip up an Excel model. Great use of my time, right? Um, but uh, had to answer a bunch of questions like that. The contract was signed. The buyer sends the money to an escrow service. You then send the, uh, basically the domains and whatnot to the buyer, and uh, that process, the broker will also help you with, like, remember to have the following 12 accounts ready to, to give over the passwords and go. We did that. The buyer gets in touch with the escrow service and says, okay, um, it is what they said it was, and then the escrow service sends you a wire for a large amount of money. And then you do aftercare for the negotiated period. Um, so that's the, uh, the uh, outline of that. I could tell you a little bit about Starfighter, but I have no time, but I'm around for the rest of the conference, so please uh, talk to me if you want to hear more about it. Um, does anyone have any questions?